Drive 365 all the way live. Welcome back to another episode of PeteCast. Here with my co-host, JP. Hey guys, how you guys doing? We also have a special guest here. You want to give his background real quick before we introduce who he is? Yeah, so the great Kurt Janowitz. Janowitz, right? Janowitz? So, you know, at, least, at least JP knows. That. Right. <laughs> well, hey, I got I got to give Kurt a hard time because Kurt gives me a hard time for being a Ravens fan since he's a uh, he's from Pittsburgh and he's a Steelers fan. I uh, hope everybody watches the draft tomorrow. Um, so we'll start off by just talking about a little bit about Kurt. So, because Kurt's not going to do it, he doesn't ever talk about his accomplishments. Um, so, Kurt, you got your psychology undergrad degree from Tufts University. Then you went on to go to Kellogg for your business school degree. Kurt has been a healthcare executive for 25 years, almost as long as I've been born, Kurt. You've been a healthcare executive. That's really impressive. So for the last 10 years, you've spent uh, your time being in senior roles with payers, physicians, and healthcare systems. And that's not even the coolest thing. So Kurt has, is currently on three non-for-profit boards uh, with that being um, MTEF, Western Racquet Club, and the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. Uh, but, Kurt, that's not it, man. You're not just on boards. You're also president on a couple of those. So you're the president, current president of MTEF, um, which is really cool. And then you were a immediate past president of Western Racquet Club. And that's not – also, you're pretty involved with M- MCW as well, another one of our partners. So the cool thing about Kurt is, besides all his leadership roles, he's really involved with Strive365 and Peak Team because he, he brings so many different leadership aspects from all these different organizations he's involved with. Yeah, and speaking of uh, MCW and updates with Strive365 as well, before we transition to Kurt, uh, we re- Strive365 recently got our IRB approved by uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, to work with uh, Milwaukee Academy of Science. So uh, I think next fall, depending on, uh, you know, if we're, uh, if school can still go on, you know, we're going to be working with the Medical College of Wisconsin and uh, Milwaukee Academy of Science to work on this IRB, which is really exciting, uh, especially with Kurt being from, from that uh, place as well. But Kurt, just kind of start off, you know, uh, looks like you have a lot of leadership roles and, you know, part of our peak cast is we like to talk about, uh, you know, ca- uh, characteristics, leadership skills that kind of help kids overcome trauma. But can you explain, you know, how how do you become a leader or what made you become a leader that you are today? Yeah, I'd say the, the thing to me, the thing I love about leadership is the ability to, to, to influence and have an impact, you know, at, at scale. So as an individual contributor, you can get a lot done. But if you have the desire and, and skill set and, and really passion for leading teams of people. You can you can impact so many more different people, populations, and, and, and just, again, have just sort of magnify that impact. So, you know, I, I have leadership roles in a bunch of different organizations. I, I really value the opportunity to do the things that, that are required in leadership, which are, I mean, really, first thing is, you know, get the right people on the bus, you know, to assemble a good team, provide them, you know, with a vision, and direction about what the key goals you want to accomplish are hold people accountable and, and, and keep them motivated. And if you're able to do those sorts of things and get out of the way, you know, people will generally do pretty um, amazing things. And so through my career, as it's, as it's evolved in business, um, and I've had some success there, I really felt like it was important to, and I always have on an individual level, given back to the community, but thought it was really important to take that to the next level, get involved with boards and with leadership roles on boards, again, to be able to have a bigger impact and to be able to, to translate some of those skills to areas that are really, um, really needed. So I, I think one of the most um, interesting things that anyone can do, the most rewarding things you can do is to successfully lead teams of people and, and, and love doing it. All right. Let me ask you, Kurt. Um, so when I first met you, I mean, I just, I just could tell you were a leader. You can just smell the leadership off of Kurt, right? Mm-hmm. Immediately when you see him. Um, so obviously, Strive 365's leader and Peak Team's leader is Dr. Brandon Curry. Uh, can you kind of expand on do you what do you see as uh, Dr. Brandon Curry's leadership role and how he really leads uh, this organization? And 
why you think he's a successful leader for not just Drive 365 and Peak Team, but uh, overall Milwaukee community. Yeah, so it's interesting you said it. If you, man, if you think you saw leadership with me, I mean, Brandon walks in a room, just every everything about him speaks leader from his physical presence, which, I mean, you can laugh about it all you want, but he, you know, <laughs> imposing physical presence, but just a very, you know, calm, assured, um, steady, um, you know, in, in, impactful, charismatic presence. So that helps right away to, to, I think, to draw people to him. So that that's great, but that that's going to get you, you know, in the door. The big thing about Brandon, though, is he has, just has so much credibility on so many levels, whether it be, you know, coming from, you know, the background, you know, from a local boy in Milwaukee sort of made good, successful athletically, you know, in, in terms of tennis, collegiate, you know, level player successful professionally, academically, getting his PhD, becoming a leader in organization, successful business-wise, being an entrepreneur, starting up his own business in, in Indianapolis. So coming back with all those different, um, uh, all that sort of street credibility as you come into town really positions him to be effective. So he can relate to the folks being impacted. He can relate to the academic folks that are required to help you know, assess some of the programming. He can relate to the business people that you're seeking funding with because he's been a business person. You know, he's got all the bases covered. And so on top of that, when you put someone in place who's just generally good natured, upbeat, funny, you know, quote unquote, good guy, you put that whole package together and you have someone who's kind of a, a force to be reckoned with. So I know one of the pictures I like the most is when we we had a, uh, a meeting at MCW as, after, after we had, had a, a brainstorming session. And he got me at five six, and then Brandon at seven nine, standing next to Chaz, and you know, it's pretty, it's pretty hilarious. But you know, people can lead in different ways, and Brandon and I have some different styles, but we, we're we're very very close and very um, complimentary of, of of each other, and he's just an outstanding leader to work with. I like how you point that out, is uh, for especially the young viewers. So a lot of kids, they struggle to want to be leaders, and they just don't have that belief in them. Um, for example, like when I was um, a young kid in high school, I was selected as a captain for my JV lacrosse team, which led on to me being captain for varsity. But when I had my coach, he didn't really, I didn't really know I was a leader. And it's it, a lot of leaders just smell leaders in there and they help them develop. For, so for our young kids, I think you pointed out something really great is you build that credibility over time. It doesn't just happen tomorrow. Some people are born with it, natural leaders, but all your accomplishments, everything you've done to this day has really led you to becoming more and more of a leader each day. Same thing as Brandon. Yeah. No, correct. 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 What I would say is to, to your point, you know, you can lead in, in small ways and in different ways, but, but, but over time it all does sort of build on, on, you know, on one another. And over time, you know, that becomes you being able to take, you know, leadership roles of, you know, maybe a person or two or smaller teams and bigger teams as you, as it compounds on itself. So I would say, but I, you know, I wouldn't be bashful. You, you have, folks lead in different ways too. So some folks lead, like you said, there are captains of athletic teams that, you know, are big on the rah-rah speeches and motivating, et cetera. There are other folks who just through sort of their tireless work ethic and, you know, willing to put them in, in harm's, self in harm's way, show the team that they're selfless. There's different ways to do it, but you know, and, and it's, and there's different styles for everyone, but you just have to find what's comfortable for you and what's going to allow you to, to, to have followers. Cause you know, you can say all you want about leaders, but that means getting people to want to line up behind you and, and want to believe in what you believe in and want to kind of have your back. So yep. lead by example, yep. get that done. Yeah, yep. I also think that a one trait is likability. You know, if people tend to kind of, you know, like you more or they're more attached to you, you know, that's a way to kind of lead people to follow you in your direction, your vision. And just speaking from the young professional side, um, for our viewers who are, you know, young professionals, uh, you know, why do people, uh, why do people participate in boards, or how do you get initiated into a board if you're trying to, you know, build your credentials or you know your resume or anything like that? How do you get initiated, and also, you know, why would you want to be a part of that? So I'll start with maybe why you'd want to be a part of it from the from the both the selfish and the selfless standpoint. So from a selfish standpoint, purely, you know, boards are a great way to meet other successful, um, like-minded, you know, connected people in the community. So even if you were looking at just from a business development perspective, it's great to run in different circles because people, especially a place like Milwaukee, especially is a pretty tight knit circle. 
So the extent that you get involved with people on one board, that'll lead you to opportunities on another board, business opportunities, potentially academic opportunities, if you're looking for grad school, whatever it might be. So that's sort of the, the selfish standpoint. From the selfless standpoint, you know, if you have, if you're the kind of person that, that wants to give back to the community, you know, I, early on in my career, I did thing like, like big brothers and I, and I, um, um, you know, work as a, in, in different organizations sort of as an individual contributor and help raise money for a heart block individually and things like that. But at a board, you're able to impact, you know, you know, with, let's say with MTF, you know, it's 500 kids year round. If you're on the board of the American Heart Association, thousands of people in the community, so selflessly, you know, you can have a bigger impact, you know, at scale, like I said, by being on boards. So there's both of those. And then to me, it's also just it's also just a way to do something um, different and expand your skill set. So being on a board from a governance standpoint is very different than managing a business day to day, managing your own finances, et cetera. You have to learn how to compromise with people, you know, look, look at all different positions from uh, a different perspectives, um, be able to make, you know, challenging you know decisions for an organization that you know you're not going to be able to please everyone so so back to your point about likability i i do agree with you that being likable is is helpful but i'd say as a leader really the other thing you're really shooting for is more to be honestly be respected because you're gonna have to make some really tough decisions and so you want to be able to draw on that bank account sort of likability but you're you're you're, you're going to be disliked a lot of the time too and um just need to be be sort of comfortable with that and on the on the back end if people respect you then that's really the most important thing Mm, that's a great advice from, from leader right there. Thanks for sharing. That's, and, that's great advice. And especially letting the youth know that it's okay to, to join a board and be different. Uh, diversity is definitely encouraged uh, to boards because you bring that different mindset, uh, which I really thought was really cool that you said, Kurt, because I'm sure when you go on boards, you bring a different perspective than other people do, but then you learn something and you're like a sponge, Kurt. You pick up so much and you can contribute it to another organization. It just all ties back together. No, I agree. And the other thing I said, even with MTF, like we're, we're looking to see, and, and even at Western Racket, a lot of times you wind up with boards. You think people have to have a ton of experience to be on a board. But what winds up happening is you have a bunch of people, let's say, that are you know, all in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, et cetera. And you, you get a little, A, you get a little myopic. B, you're not really prepared, you know, a lot, a lot of times sort of your target audience are millennials and other people who, you know, you really want to understand perspective. So I, we're trying to actually um, have much younger folks join the MTF board, younger folks join the Western Racket Club board, et cetera, to provide the perspective. So I think there's an opportunity more so than ever for the younger generation to get involved. And so the other thing I'd say, though, is don't expect, don't expect necessarily all these people to reach out to you. You have to do your part, start to network start to reach out and those opportunities will become available to you. So if you do have that interest, you know, I'd encourage you to be, to be, um, to be proactive and it's not really risky. It's not like, you know, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, you know it's not like asking someone on a date, you're going to have to face lots of rejection. If you're able and willing to serve on boards, man, there's more than enough causes out there. So if you have that aptitude and interest, I think you're going to face a lot of positive response and, 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 and have a lot of opportunity to do it. And that's great to hear because, you know, young professionals, I think, again, you know, you don't want to recruit in the same circle because you're not expanding your network. But recruiting people who have different backgrounds, different experiences, is definitely going to grow that board's network and kind of uh, increase, increase your resources. And so I think that's how we really kind of combined uh, met you, Kurt, and with Strive365 because it feels like with us, you're so connected with us in so many realms. So, like, for yeah. example, oh, uh, Western Racket Club, right, where we, we host our annual, uh, we host our field trip there with, uh, we have about, like, we had about, like, 400 kids come that day. And then also we're connected with you guys through Milwaukee Tennis Education Foundation where we do our peak team programming in there. And then we also work uh, connected with you through uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin and our IRB. So with that being said, you know, in your eyes, how do you see – how does Drive Three Six Five connect to what you do as a whole? Yeah, so for me, and it really, I'd say, if I look at my role at Medical College in Wisconsin, I mean, we have really holistic missions. We have a clinical mission to make sure people are healthy and stay well and 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 and, and are cared for appropriately. We have a community engagement mission to make sure that you know, we have, we are connected with the community that, that there's, there's opportunities out there that we serve underserved folks in the right way. We have a research mission 
to see what programs might work best in the community what went, and what worked best from a clinical perspective. And all those things come together in terms of Strive. So when I think about it, you know, it's like the perfect, perfect um, alignment with medical college. So, you know, here's how, how I look at it. I look at it from a clinical perspective. We're way under resourced in the amount of mental health professionals that we have. And even in terms of some of the clinical professionals that we have for preventive care. So we can't be everywhere, too expensive, not going to be resourced appropriately. So how can we have programs that help as a buffer, help as an intervention, help prevent some of the trauma that can occur, that can help triage folks if necessary to the right resources, et cetera. Then we look at this model, you know, this drives 365 as the whole peak team program and say, wow, you know, we're, we're a scientific, you know, based organization. What, 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 what resources and what programs are going to be the best? So how can we test those programs? How can we figure out, take the best of what's working and get rid of something that doesn't work? So this whole IRB approach of where we're testing the model with different students, different populations, et cetera. Again, ideal medical college has that research mission and we can lie on that front. And then, you know, you talk about the, the, the just the community engagement underserved populations. You know, your, your sweet spot is, is underserved populations across the community. Those are exactly the kind of folks that we're trying to connect with. So as I came to medical college, it was just this sort of confluence of all of these different interests um, that I had and, and organizations I was involved with that now sort of set up the perfect paradigm where we can be, you know, partners and collaborators across multiple fronts. And really, it, the neat thing about it is it's not like one plus one plus one is three. It really is like 10 when you put all these together, the impact that we can have with, with less resources than if we're all going about it individually. I'd say the coolest thing is, Kurt, that uh, along with all your different organizations that you're involved with, it seems that you still have the common goal. And that's what I think Strive365, we all have the same common goal is trying to provide to the community of Milwaukee um, the best we can and to improve the community and lifestyle and provide educational opportunities to the youth. Yeah, and it's not about, you know, inventing your own wheel, but it's straight collaboration, you know, using what people have started and continue to add on and build on those resources. So, uh, you know, I'm really glad we're able to work together. Um, yeah, I think I think what's especially important too, especially in light of what's going on with the whole COVID nineteen pandemic. If anything, resources are going to be stretched thinner. People are going to be able to give less money. It's going to be more important than ever for each organization to partner with other organizations to provide resources, so you're not duplicating efforts. And so the the the, the I think the path that we had going before and it's been so successful will be even more critical. Otherwise, you know we're together or apart, we're not gonna be able to serve the communities that, that we need to serve. And so I think that alignment and that, that partnership is gonna to have to become even stronger for us to meet all of our objectives. Yep, I'd say I'd say one word to sum that up that is actually my one of my favorite words is efficiency. Uh, just being efficient, I mean, it's like, I always look at it like, even when you play sports, just because you scored 20 points off 20 shots, that might not be efficient. Just as you're saying, if we're all doing the same thing when we could have all worked together to achieve the same goal. Um, it's just less resources and uh, working together and having some different mindsets put together, but all resulting in the same results. Um, mm -hmm. Kurt, so trauma, when you hear the word trauma, I'm sure you had much more uh, of a background of what trauma is than most of our viewers do, even more than what me and JP probably had more, uh, less than a year ago. I didn't really understand what trauma was every day. It's something that I'm learning more and more about. Uh, what's one word, Kurt, that you would relate uh, trauma to? One word that comes to your mind, the first thing. Yeah, I guess if I, if I had to pick one, one word, I'd say fear. And I think what, what that translates into is different things for different people. So some people, you know, when they're scared, lash out, want to fight, be aggressive, etc., other folks who were treating it are kind of in a little world and become real passive. So people undergo trauma, you know, it, it's fearful for that one event. And then it puts you in this state of constant like arousal and fear. And so that's what I associated with. And I'm sorry not to get too um, sort of philosophical, but it, even though me personally, I've been really fortunate in my life, I have not experienced much, you know, my A score is probably, you know, zero or maybe, maybe it was one at one point in my life, but I've been really fortunate. But I grew up, my father was a person who um, really took an interest in sort of underprivileged youth and took people into our house. We always had someone living with us, almost like foster kids, helping out, you know, kids that had come from really bad homes involved with 
drugs or abuse or these types of things. So we always had people in our home that he was helping. And then he was always a person involved with, you know, the boys club, big brothers, all these different things. So he taught me from a young age, like it's important to give back. It's important to be involved. And I grew up in a pretty mixed neighborhood in Pittsburgh um, where you could see a lot of the trauma going on, but because I was so heavily involved with sports, you could see the impact that sports and, and coaches and mentors had on these people to, to, to keep, you know, a lot of people not only out of trouble, but just, you know, really, really thriving. And so that was my, like, I came in to being an adult with all that background and that sort of um, bias. And so it was real easy for me to make this sort of transition. Whereas I think if you don't have a role model as a parent, if you don't grow up in those circumstances, it might be a little harder for you to relate or connect. And I'll just lead to one more point before I stop. That's why one of the reasons I think it's so important. People think like, ah, like you're, you know, you're on the board of Western Racket Club, you know, private exclusive club. Like, what the heck does it have to do with underserved folks? Well, I think it actually has a lot to do. First of all, it's people with resources who can help, and second of all, the connection needs to go both ways. The Western people, you know, the more the folks who are, you know, not not as adversely impacted, need to understand and what what these issues are, et cetera, and be exposed. And by the same token, like the kids at MTF, they should see kind of what's out there. If they work hard. They learn how to play tennis. They make connections. Here's what's out there for them. So it's bridging those two worlds mm-hmm. that, that commonly, and especially in a city like Milwaukee, not it was better in Pittsburgh, but you know, tougher in Milwaukee. Those 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 those, those bridges are hardly ever crossed. And so to me, it's absolutely essential. So I think it does play in. And um, you know, just wanted to give you a little perspective of kind of where 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 I was coming from. Yeah. No. Like uh, honestly, what. Um, you and Tim and Corwin were able to help us with when we did the MTC and brought the kids in. Um, definitely a shout out to Tim and for that as well. Um, yeah. Don't want to give you all the credit, Kurt. <laughs> uh, no, Tim is awesome. But no, both of you were very, uh, very great about making sure that we involved kids, and it was the first time um, that was something that was included and. There was a lot of risks that were involved with that, um, especially with a lot of kids there. You don't know someone, a yeah. kid could get injured, a kid could possibly get hurt by running onto the tennis court or just so many different things that could have happened. But you and Tim and took that big risk and uh, it was it was so rewarding to see so many kids come and watch uh, great tennis for the first time in their life. And they left saying, man, I, I hope this happens next year again. Thank you, guys. And they just look like they had a great, great field trip. Better than they probably had some of them. Some of them, I mean, where, where do they go? They go to the museums or art, go see art, places like that. But seeing tennis is something so unique and come into such a high-level club uh, really gave them an opportunity to see uh, something different. Yeah, and so and, go ahead. Go ahead, Kurt. I say I want to give props to, to Stride Three Six Five. I mean, yeah, that was a Herculean task to pull that off with that many kids, that well coordinated. And honestly, I mean, the beautiful thing was like just like I was referencing, the members at Western were like, "What a phenomenal experience! It enhanced the event. It enhanced the event for the players. The club wants to have folks back. More folks are interested now. Like, oh, what the heck was that? Like, what organization is that involved with? Oh, like maybe I should help the class. Oh, the classic." Oh, that organization also does, you know, scholarship for kids. Sorts. Of, oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, wait a minute, and that and, and, that, and that's tied in with MTF because some of those are your students. Mm-hmm. The, the awareness that it creates, the interest that it creates, and the ability to create common ground. And like you, you know, just you, you, you can you can laugh at it, but there aren't you know there aren't that many you know private clubs and things that would, and and, and an organ, community organizations like that would come together to put something on at this scale. So I commend you guys a lot for for having the vision to do it and also for executing really well. Well, we appreciate you guys being receptive about it and and giving us the uh, keys to do it. Yeah, because I think yep. it's not easy to have a uh, like a, a club to allow you know students who aren't members come in and let them explore what you know the club life is about. And like what's crazy, like we had about four, four, four different partners come in. You know, we had Brown mm-hmm. Deer School District. Hong American Peace Academy, Milwaukee Academy of Sciences, Malika Early Learning Center. So these are all different uh, age groups, groups, age groups, different groups in the community. And it really opened their eyes. And uh, shout out to Cousin Subs as well. You know, we we're able to feed the kids. They're, they're able to see great tennis matches, singles and doubles, but also see a great venue and really open their eyes like, wow, this is, you know, I'm not just... Uh, surrounded by where I live at now, but there's opportunities for me to kind of grow and expand out to, you know, where I want to be. And I think 
Western Racket, Racket Club is, is a symbol of that to say, hey, you know, if you guys work hard and you focus on, you, you know, your education, you know, being a great student, you know, overcoming stress or trauma in your life, you know, you could succeed and have these goals. Um, yep. And I think not only that, it's great because uh, every time I go to the di to our different partner schools, We'll always see them with their uh, peak team Strive Three Six Five shirts and different all, colors too. Yeah, that different colors. Cool yeah. and they always like. When, when are we gonna go back to that next to that field trip again? So, Kurt, I gave you a shirt, didn't I? I guess, I'm saying I'm just gonna say I don't I, I don't know if I have a peak team shirt. Okay, oh, well yeah, okay, that'll okay, be that'll one. be sent to you, Kurt. One. What size are you? I need one. Uh, give me two large. All right, I got Especially you. Especially with quarantine, I might need large. All right. <laughs> Same here, man. I got you. I'll get you one. <laughs> yeah, that'll be on the way, Kurt. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Cool. And so you know, along with that, uh, I guess MTEF was in that as well. Um, you know, with COVID here, and you know, peak team is supposed to be with uh, MTEF over the summer. But you know, how is that mm -hmm. looking for you guys right now? How are you guys preparing for that? If you know, if, if COVID, so yeah. Yeah, we're still gearing up as if we're going to, you know, have us all things, you know, especially, anyway, I'll, let me take a step back. Nobody knows what the virus is exactly going to do, and, and that'll, that'll control the pace. That being said, of all the things, the programs that may come back, sports-wise, tennis is probably higher on the list. We'll probably have to revamp maybe a little bit of the structure of how we do things, et cetera, but hopefully we'll be able to continue to have a summer program, and you guys continue, um, Stride 365 can continue to support with the peak program. So we're sort of all systems go for now and readying. Um, you never know. And, 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 and it's been sort of bumpy, but um, we're, we're excited about the opportunity to not only participate with you all again, but to expand the scope, expand the influence of the program and be able to document more results about the positive impact that the um, peak team programming can have on our, on our, our, our kids. It's been hard for us, honestly, during the, the shutdown, not having contact with our high performance um, team folks as much as we would like. We've been able to do um, a few fitness oriented type of um, online classes and we've remained in contact, but it's been really hard on the kids and it's been really hard on our on our staff throughout the whole ordeal. All right, and you know, I'll just let you know, we Stride 365 are ready, me, Coach James, uh, coach has sounded ready to come out there because you know I'm ready to enjoy the summer. You know, stuck in I'm the out, office yeah. all day. I love coming out and playing with the kids, teaching them some life skills. So um, you know, we're excited. We're ready to come out. You know, ready to uh, unleash our curriculum on them as well. So, yeah. Kurt, I'm I'm gonna put you on the spot, Kurt. I don't know if you're ready for right. this, but I think all right. Well, one person he might he might not like what you say, but let's see. Uh, JP, James, and Tony. Three individuals who are heavily involved with Peak Team and MTEF. JP, don't get hurt if Kurt doesn't say you're you're the best, okay? Yeah. But yeah. out of these three, I kind of just want you to give me give me your assessment on how you see them being leaders. And I think them three have really stepped up to the plate. I've seen them grow. I don't know Tony as much as I know the other two, but I talk to Tony quite a bit here and there. And the three of them, I see them as phenomenal leaders and people who stepped up to the plate on something they had no idea about. They were handed a curriculum, learned it very quickly, and were able to adapt. And I thought they did a phenomenal job this summer. But I kind of want to hear from your point of view. These three, do you see as leaders? What are their strengths? And where do you see them going as far as leadership? Yeah, so let me, I'll start selfishly with Tony just because it's MTF, man. You know, Tony sort of, he, he sort of got the, you know, the classic leadership skills in the sense that he can relate to his students. He, um, he's a great communicator with them, builds a lot of connectivity with them, totally passionate. I mean, you talk about a guy that's like mission first, um, you know, nothing's more important to Tony than the mission, even when it's kind of put him in, uh, in, 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 in you know, in, in some, in some, you know, tougher circumstances. So he's got, obviously he's got the skills to teach tennis, but for me, it's more important about how he connects with the kids, draws, draws them in, is able to get them to share and confide in him. And so some of this, you know, some of these kind of peak team programming can, some of the trauma related programs can get through to them. So Tony's been awesome. And it's been, I think he's really appreciated as an opportunity to grow and learn and allow him to be more effective as a leader. Then you got, you know, you got, you got James. James is just like sort of, 
take charge has stepped in. And we've had gaps in terms of, you know, some coaches. We went through some tough times at MTF. He's really helped to fill in, provide direction, provide direction to Tony, help buttress our resources um, in terms of being able to continue to provide the programming and provide that sort of, you know, more more firm, hands-on leadership moving forward. And then, man, JP's like the silent assassin, man. He's like behind <laughs> the scenes, he had really unassuming, like that's sort of different ways to lead. But all this stuff is coordinated, tightly organized. He's ready, you know. And so the point is, those three guys have very different ways. You know, Tony more like touchy-feely, James more a little bit, you know, like maybe punch you in the face. JP, <laughs> you know, more like behind pulling the puppet master strings. But all three of them together collectively are able to really deliver, you know, quality results. And to your point, though, this came together so quickly. Like when you think, I mean, this whole thing came together in like six or eight weeks last summer. We jumped in as MTF to pilot it. You guys pulled it off successfully. And now you're growing and building. And, and, and I'm just really excited about the prospects that come, especially with Brandon now, you know, at the helm and with the new organizational changes. Just couldn't be more excited for the future and partnering with you guys. Yeah, and once again, Kurt, we uh, really are thankful that you took a leap of faith on us because you were our pilot program and took it so quickly, and I remember that. I remember when it was being introduced, we had a little trauma training. Uh, Tony, I mean, when you talk about dedicated, uh, came all the way down Chicago with uh, Mike, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you, you were also really involved in that, and you were very engaged and wanting to learn the curriculum jp and james picked it up very fast and you guys just implemented it so effectively uh, and i have one really funny story about tony right uh when yeah. he hears this he's gonna laugh he already knows what the story is because i'm never gonna let it go so after mtc there was a day where it was me jp and tony working uh inside and we ordered some extra subs and they were turkey subs so I come from a Muslim uh, uh -huh. background, so I can't eat pork. So I said, Tony, you take all the ham ones, I'll take all the turkey ones, okay? So I'm driving home, and I realize, where are the turkey subs? So it turns out Tony actually took all the subs, took the turkey <laughs> and the ham ones. So I see him. Yeah, he took all of them, and I, there was at least 20 subs in probably both of them, minimum. And I asked Tony, and I said, Tony, what would you do with the subs, man? Like, you ate 40 subs? And this is how dedicated he is to making a difference. He said, no, man, I didn't eat the subs. He said, I went and dropped them off at a homeless shelter. I mean, just the commitment he yep. has of making mm -hmm. a difference to this community is just beautiful to see. And I guess I can forgive him. I wish he would have left me one. I was pretty hungry the next day, but it's okay. Hey, the cause the cause was better. Yeah, we, we, we really sorry, need – oh, Sorry. I'll say we really need those type of individuals that make – to make our team whole who are passionate about the mission and vision and you know willing to serve the community like that so you know um tony's a great guy so we hope to get more people like that on board too we're, we're all lucky to have him man he's mm -hmm. a phenomenal guy yeah and then kurt i would also ask you to kind of expand on um what you want to do for strive 365 what you what your future goals are with us and what you really envision strive 365 and peak team uh, becoming what do you think it's yeah. going to become and how fast is it growing and also along with this COVID-19 we are a little slowed up but we're still finding ways to be involved as is MTEF and all the organizations you work with but just kind of give me a, a idea of where do you think Strive 365 is going and what you want to what you want it to be yeah I mean the long-term vision obviously has got to be is again I talked about from the very beginning have an impact impact at scale so how does this, if this works here, how does it then work in Chicago? How does it work in Detroit, maybe Philly? How do we get, how do we get proof points? How do we get enough proof points that this is working, that you can build up the funding and you can have impact, you know, in, 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 in lots of metropolitan areas around the country in order to do that, as you know, I mean, I know Brandon's working hard at this and we've had conversations. How do you guys find, you know, uh, 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 a home that, that's located in the right area, that's got the right structure so you can get the right people in place and serve. So in the near term, you know, getting that home base that could also be a home base for MTF, getting the results documented about what's successful, what isn't tight, titrating the program, and then having it blow out at scale over the next few years to really be, you know, a regional and then maybe even, you know, a national influence. That's the reason to get involved with something like this is to, to, to look and, you know, you never know. I mean, maybe, maybe we only, I say only, wind up having an impact in Milwaukee and a few other communities. That's phenomenal in and of itself. Absolutely. And that's well worth it. But the hope is that we do, we go, 
um, beyond. And that first step is to really get a, you know, a, a, a home base and a, and a, and a, and a infrastructure in place to be able to, to, to drive that. So I'm super excited about working with you guys, super excited about working with Brandon and appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to, to listen to me rave a little bit. So mm-hmm. thanks. No, we appreciate you coming on Kurt. And, uh, one thing you guys should know about Kurt, he's a diehard Steelers fan. He puts aside his differences. I'm a Baltimore Ravens fan, and Kurt has never, well, maybe he has, but not that many times given me a hard time about being a Steelers fan and me being a Ravens I think fan. We, I, I think one time this summer, I'm going to come with my Terry Bradshaw Bicentennial throwback jersey to somebody donating me. You bring your best Ravens jersey, and maybe we'll do We'll play a little uh, left-handed tennis or something on the court and see, see, let the kids cheer us on so you win. Well, you Kurt, I think even if you went with your left and I went with my right, you would probably still win. I'm not the best tennis player, but... That's why I said left, <laughs> man. I wasn't trying to embarrass you, man. We'll both go left. You know? Okay, I appreciate it. We'll do it, Kurt. We'll do it. We'll put on a little charity event. All right. Well, thanks, Kurt, for your time. Appreciate you. Um, you know, we'll look forward to seeing you soon after the COVID. So Strive365, checking out. Never thought I would say a Steelers fan can be an exceptional leader. Right, Kurt? Just kidding. Kurt, we're really thankful to have you around and have you be a collaborative leader with Strive365 and someone who we can really learn from. Uh, We hope the viewers and listeners really took away from your experiences and how that's really built you into being the great leader you are today. So thank you for that, and uh, we look forward to learning from you more and more. Next week, we're going to have Mr. Anthony McHenry, who is the CEO of MAS. Anthony McHenry is someone who is very humble, wanting to give back and create a new and improved atmosphere for MAS and all around him. Anthony doesn't really talk about his success as an athlete. However, you guys will learn that he is actually a Rose Bowl champion. But that is not what he prides himself on. He prides himself on creating a great environment for MAS and those around him. So tune in next week to learn from another great leader and someone who is really going to make a difference in this community for a long, long time. 